it turns out it takes about 20 years from the beginning of the pathophysiology to reach a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. You'll be surprised to see that in fact, your cognition will be improved and can be improved at any age. This is about improving, unlocking the synaptoblastic side of the neuroplasticity. And to do that, you've got to get at what's causing. We've had some amazing examples recently, people who did some of the right things but were still declining and then it turned out that they had something that was unrecognized. In one case, major organic toxin that hadn't been picked up before. Once that was addressed, the person started to improve again. In other cases, it'll be specific pathogens that haven't been recognized before. Again, once they're addressed, people start to improve. And by the way, Drew, one of the things that's come out really commonly that we did not understand previously, how important it actually is, is uh, nocturnal oxygen desaturation. And there was a wonderful study that showed that if you simply look at the mean SpO2, so the mean oxygen saturation while you are sleeping, that is directly proportional to the volume of specific nuclei in your brain. So as you begin to fall with your oxygenation, and we see this all the time, where people didn't realize they're falling below the 96 to 98% percent that you'd like to see. Of course, we hear a lot about this with COVID-19, about oxygen saturation. But many of us are dropping while we sleep without having COVID-19. We're simply dropping because of sleep apnea or other reasons. UARS is another big one. But for whatever reason, we drop that saturation. We see people dropping not only to the low 90s, but into the 80s. And we've even seen people into the low 70s. Wow. This is starving your brain during that time. So in fact, you need to increase that. And one of the things that people find is they do better when they actually address this reduction in oxygen saturation while they sleep. And usually they don't look for it. So critical to do that as part of the treatment for cognitive decline or risk for decline. Incredible. And I want to go into some of those because you lay a lot of them out in the protocol inside the book in great detail for people to follow. But I want to take a step back. And, you know, we have people of all ages listening to this uh, podcast. Let's even start. You shared uh, some of the stats, but give us a few more of the global statistics and why it seems to be that when people talk about some of the scariest diseases, chronic diseases that are out there, why Alzheimer's often finds itself at the top of the list that's there. So what are the stats that we know, whether it's U.S. or globally, about Alzheimer's and cognitive decline? It's a really great point. You know, um, so loss of cognition has replaced cancer as the number one worry of people as we age. And of course, we have an aging society. You know, the, the silver tsunami is upon us. Uh, those of us who are baby boomers, including myself, um, are all reaching an older age now. And this is a huge issue and is, of course, going to bankrupt Medicare within the next about 15 years um, if we don't do something about it. So this is a huge issue. And as you indicated, I mean, the statistics we hear are, are horrible. And in fact, the, the reality is even worse than the statistics. Here's, here's why. There are about 5.6 million Americans who have a current diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. My two daughters, for example, too young to know if they're going to get Alzheimer's yet. So let's ask the question of the current about 323 million living Americans. How many of us will die with Alzheimer's disease? Well, if nothing has changed, about 45 million of us currently living Americans will die of Alzheimer's disease. This is a huge problem. This is a trillion dollar global pandemic. And we've heard a lot about the pandemic, COVID-19. Alzheimer's is killing far, far, far more than that. And of course, the two are actually linked because in fact, many of the same features that give us risk for Alzheimer's also give us risk for poor outcomes in COVID-19. It's just that COVID-19 has taken the decades long timeline of Alzheimer's and has compressed it into about two weeks. So yes, 
with obesity. We are at increased risk for both. Yes, with poor immunity, we are at increased risk for both. Yes, with low vitamin D, we are at increased risk for both. And on and on, type 2 diabetes, another critical risk factor for both. And of course, one of the major things that's coming out of the COVID-19 studies is that we all should be spending more time outdoors. As was pointed out, in the Wuhan studies, they found that every case they looked at had transmission indoors except one. So when they had these sudden bursts, these were all from people getting together indoors. Indoors is where the droplets are. It's where the duct work is, the air conditioning. It's much different. There's the lower humidity factor, which is more likely to transmit the viruses through the air. Exactly. You go outdoors, now things dissipate. And what's interesting is we see the same thing in Alzheimer's. Indoors is where the mycotoxins are. We build our homes out of mold food. So we are at increased risk when we spend more time indoors. Of course, indoors is where the refrigerator is. Indoors is where the sedentary lifestyle is. Indoors is where the couch and the TV are. All of these things that are going you know, to increase our risk. So we want to get out there. We want to get more exercise. We want to dissipate any uh, potential for these various pathogens. So, um, so this is one of the things that's, that's coming out of here. Uh, and you know, again, these these things are all critical. We understanding this disease and understanding it better and better will make it so that this is truly a rare, rare disease, just as it should be. Mm. You know, inside of those stats that you've shared, one of the things that your work has really put the spotlight on is an understanding that just like you shared earlier that Alzheimer's isn't caused by one thing, so it's not going to be one thing that helps unravel it. There's also this idea that even though you don't have a diagnosis yet for Alzheimer's, you could be on your way. And so there's factors that are going on in your 30s and 40s and 50s, well before most people would be diagnosed with Alzheimer's, that can increase your risk of, of getting it. Talk to us a little bit more about that and how just because you don't have a diagnosis doesn't mean, you know, I think in the traditional public, people think like you either have something or you don't have something. Talk to us about how maybe that's not actually true. This is so important because, you know, it used to be thought you either had diabetes or you didn't have diabetes. Then now we understand there's pre-diabetes. We understand that even before that, there's insulin resistance, etc. And the same thing is coming out here. And one of the points, one of the reasons that, uh, that I wrote the second book was because people would say, well, look, I'm not going to worry about this Alzheimer's disease of your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, I'm 35, I'm 40 or 45. Well, it turns out, in fact, that Two things have happened since then. Number one, it turns out it takes about 20 years from the beginning of the pathophysiology to reach a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So what we thought of in the past as a disease of the 60s, 70s, and 80s is really a disease of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's just that this plays out, you get the manifestations later on. But the second thing is, just as we have seen childhood obesity, child type 2 diabetes like never before. We're seeing the same thing. There are people in their teens and 20s who are damaging their own ability to think, to do their best on various testing on the, in their school, etc. because of the fact that they have ongoing inflammation. They have ongoing things that haven't been addressed. Poor methylation, for example, that hasn't been addressed. Uh, unknown pathogens, chronic inflammation, various toxic exposure. And again, we see these, we make diagnoses, including things like Parkinson's from various toxins later in life. But when you're young, in fact, this can affect you. And therefore, we argue people should be looking into this early. If you've got a family history especially, you'll be surprised to see that in fact, your cognition will be improved and can be improved at any age. We, we recommend that everybody who's 45 years of age or, or older, just as you know, when you turn 50, you get a colonoscopy. When you turn 45, or if you're older than 45, please get a cognoscopy. It's, it's simple, and we go into the book how to do that. But even people who are in their teens, 20s, and 30s will find that they do better with more energy, addressing the same sorts of things that are actually down the road going to increase their risk for Alzheimer's disease. Let's talk a little bit origin story, because I think the question that a lot of listeners have 
right now is that in the midst of all these stats, these overwhelming stats about Medicare going bankrupt, about the rate of cognitive decline increasing in society, the epidemic of Alzheimer's that there is there. You've been in the field of anti-aging for a while. At what point in your story did you start to see the first glimpses that gave you hope that something else was possible? Yeah, that's a, you know, such a good point. So we were actually working again with the, with the old model. Look, but you're looking at, could we understand the fundamental nature of the neurodegenerative process? And we worked on this for 30 years in the laboratory, looking at following cells that committed suicide, cell death, just as it happens in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's and other degenerative. And this was at UCLA? This was at multiple places. This was at UCLA. This was at the Burnham Institute in San Diego. And then this was at the Buck Institute uh, in Northern California. And so we looked specifically at the drivers of this. And what we found was very interesting. So there are many different things that impact on an example, APP. So this is the thing that is at the heart of Alzheimer's disease. APP is a protein called amyloid precursor protein. So it's actually the parent molecule of the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. And what we found was that this thing actually is a molecular switch. So it actually responds to these many different processes. And what happens, it's, it's a, kind of amazing because it's a, it's a little bit like having you know, the president of your country. And in the book I wrote about it as, you know, you're the president of my brain of Stan. So when you've got things that are actually going well, you have enough trophic support. You, know, you don't have invaders, uh, whether it's invaders to your country or invaders to your brain. Uh, you don't have major problems with inflation, et cetera. And I like an inflation to, uh, uh, to insulin sensitivity versus resistance. Then no surprise, you decide to grow and maintain. And that's what your brain is doing when things are good. And therefore, your APP is actually cut. And this thing is sitting in the membranes of your neurons. It is to a lesser extent in other cells as well. And it is particularly rich at synapses. So this thing is sitting there and it's gauging these various inputs. So it responds, interestingly, to things like your estradiol level, your testosterone level, your vitamin D level, your status of inflammation, and on and on. When things are good, this molecule will be cut at a single site, which is just outside the membrane, and one peptide that results now signals others to say things are good, I'm going to support making and keeping synapses. In other words, we can afford to make and keep new synapses. We can afford neuroplasticity. The other piece of it is inside, is signaling to that cell to say, yes, we're going to support growth and maintenance. So again, very much like the head of a country saying, this is what we're going to do as a country. On the other hand, when you now change that formula, you reduce your estradiol or your testosterone, your vitamin D, you have inflammation, you have now invasion, no surprise, you have a completely different response. Now you actually have that same molecule that is cleaved at three sites, beta, gamma, and caspase sites. It therefore produces four peptides, two that are external, two that are internal. And now the message is completely different. The message is we are being invaded or we don't have enough support to make new synapses. Therefore, the only way we're going to survive is to pull back. So it's literally saying you, you have got to have a brain in retreat. We know that, okay, we're going to send out this amyloid, which is now going to kill the invading microbes. It actually binds some of the invading toxins, like, for example, iron, high iron levels. Uh, the A-beta actually binds to this, as Professor Ashley Bush showed many years ago. So these things are responding to insults and therefore actually protective. But in protecting, they are say, saying, we're going to live with a smaller brain. We're going to live with fewer synapses. Now, Drew, you can imagine what's going to happen. You just keep the insult going. Keep people exposed to the same thing. The doctor doesn't check the right things. You get continued exposure. What do you think happens? You just keep going down 
down. You keep on pulling back, pulling up. Now, if you can identify what's doing that, you can get rid of that and you can now stop the process and begin the rebuilding. And so you really do have to look at what's driving this because you can see fundamentally how this works with APP being cleaved to go one direction or to go another direction. And that's what the research showed us. So the goal then was to take all of that research over those years and now translate that into a workable program. If you do it in a generic sense and just say, well, everybody do this, this, and this, yes, it works sometimes, but many times you don't identify what's actually driving the problem. So you really do have to be a Sherlock Holmes. You really have to do, get in there, um, just as, of course, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Hyman and his colleagues do with looking at integrative medicine. You want to look at the things that are driving the process. This is a root cause analysis. The good news is the research shows us many of these root causes. We know the things that are driving this decline. And therefore, for each person, we can tease these out and then have a program. So this is a personalized program that is going to be targeted. This is precision medicine targeted toward the things that are actually driving the decline. Or of course, the hope is targeting to the things that are giving you risk, that there isn't decline there already. So that's what the research showed us over the years. By the way, it also showed us that when you start to, to ferret this out, you find that there are different subtypes of Alzheimer's, and that was very helpful in terms of addressing the underlying drivers. So before we talk about the subtypes, which we'll get to in a second, when you did that initial culmination of that research that you continued at multiple places, yeah. ultimately that led to designing a protocol, a program right. that right. you would trial and error and put people on. And then that led to the publishing of the first case studies that are there. Talk right. to us about that. What were some of the first case studies that you published and, and what was the goal of them? What did you show and what was the goal for the larger community to see what was possible in, the, in, the, in these case studies? Yes, good point. So we actually started by looking then once we kind of could see this balance, this molecular switch, we thought, this was now back in 2007, we thought, okay, great, let's develop a drug that changes that balance. And we kind of weren't looking at root cause at the time. We thought, okay, if APP can go either direction, let's simply develop a drug that forces it in the, the good direction. Well, of course, it turns out that's an overly simplistic way to think about it. Back in 2007, we didn't realize that. So we screened thousands of drug candidates to look for things that would actually put you on the right side of that balance. And so we identified a few, actually, we identified some that had very good brain penetration that looked like very good candidates for drugs. But as we got set to do the first clinical trial, and this was now back in 2011, I realized, well, wait a minute, we're going to end up, these other things that cause this this cleavage are simply going to go around our drug. I mean, that's kind of this idea of just hitting it at one point when you've got a very complex network of things going on. Um, it, it became clear to me that that was an overly simplistic way to attack this network. It's a little bit like saying, okay, you know, we're going to see, we're going to try to change the entire culture of your company. We're going to change, you know, one person who's, a, you know, who's doing reception in, in Cleveland or something like that. It's not that simple. You're going to have to change key locations throughout. You're changing the culture of your entire company. Same idea here. We are changing network function for a very complex network of synapses within the brain. And therefore, I thought, okay, in this trial, We'll do the drug we discovered, but let's also target all the different things that are contributing to it. Let's look at whether NF-kappa B is activated as part of inflammation. Let's look at whether there is insulin resistance, whether the hormones are too low, whether there are specific toxins, et cetera. So in 2011, then, we proposed the first comprehensive trial in the history of Alzheimer's disease. And we were quickly turned down by the review boards because they said, hey, you're trying to look at more than one variable. And so we said, yeah, but this is a more than one variable disease. It's overly simplistic to say, okay, we're just going to hit it with one thing that does one, hits one little piece and we're going to expect everything to fall in line. That's not the way the brain works. It's not and the way so that life works in many aspects. 
You know, Absolutely. Like what's the way, one thing that makes a relationship successful. And if people just did that one thing, then every relationship would be successful. Well, unfortunately, it's not just one thing. You know, it's so true. And then, and then here, you know, we're hearing the same thing now with aging. Let's just take a drug and aging will go away. And, you know, that's again, that's not the way aging works. There are many contributors. And so, you know, we're looking at the same sort of thing for anti-aging, as you mentioned earlier. And right now, we're actually looking at patient zeros with other diseases. So we had our patient zero back in 2012. What happened was when we got turned down in 2011, we started looking at how do we convince the review boards that we should, in fact, be doing a multivariable trial because that's the way the disease works. And so at that time, I got a call from a woman, actually, whose friend was about to commit suicide, who lived back on the East Coast. She'd already been told by her doctor, you have Alzheimer's disease. Her mother had died from Alzheimer's as well. Uh, She was told, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to die from this disease, et cetera. And then he wrote in the chart, you know, Alzheimer's disease. And then she was unable to get long-term insurance, which is common when you, if someone writes memory problems in your chart or neurodegeneration or Alzheimer's disease, you're not gonna be able to purchase long-term care insurance. So she had decided to commit suicide. She called her friend who happened to be on the, on the West Coast, um, who said, well, I, I've heard that there's some research going on at the Buck Institute, maybe you should come out here. So I got a call and I said, look, you know, I haven't seen a patient in 20 years. We've been working in a lab on this. I said, you know, if you're a mouse, I can probably help you. Um, But, uh, you know, as a human being, probably, you know, probably not, but I can tell you what our research has shown and what I can tell you what we were going to do for the clinical trial. So we, we spent hours going over all these little pieces. And she, of course, uh, her memory was not good. She was writing all this stuff down. And I said, look, if you want to you know, take this back to your doctor on the East Coast, uh, talk to him about it. But that's all I really have to offer right now because we're not allowed to do the trial. So I was really shocked when three months later, I got a call in my home on a Saturday. And she said, I can't believe it. And she said, I'm back at work. My memory's better than it's been in 20 years. Things are great. And and now she is over eight years from when she started this. And as you know, the natural history for cognitive decline is for nothing but decline. You may have a good day and a bad day here and there, but but the natural history is for continued decline. So anyone who's having the problem she did eight years ago would be expected to be in a nursing home by now. She is now in her mid-70s. She's doing great. In fact, she's working as a brain health coach. Um, she still travels overseas uh, and uh, is doing all sorts of things, um, doing very, very well. And, and interestingly, she actually went off the program four different times, as I mentioned in the book. Uh, and each time, after about seven to 10 days, she began to experience some decline once again. Uh, you know, the bottom line is you need to keep that signaling going in the right direction. And as long as you do that, the great news is you've actually gotten at the contributors, the things that are driving the process. And so you can continue to do well. And we see people all the time who will improve and then stabilize and then add different uh, features, attack something else, improve further and continue to do that. So that's another- When you stop doing the work, it stops working. Absolutely. And then that's what exactly what she's experienced. And so she's really stuck with it and done um, extremely well. Um, another big surprise has been that we talked to people about 36 holes in the roof because we initially identified 36 different molecular mechanisms that all contribute to this process. And so we want to attack them all. Well, the good news is you don't have to attack every single one of them, just as uh, others have shown in the past with cardiovascular disease. Uh, such as Dr. Dean Ornish, for example, Um, you can see this. Once you get over the threshold, people begin to get on the correct side. They're actually improving things instead of getting worse. And we see the same thing with cognition. Once you get over that threshold, you don't have to address every single thing. In her case, by the way, she, she addressed 12 out of the 36. And for her, that was enough. That put her on the right side. She's improved. And now over eight years later, she's continuing to do very, very well. And we have a number of other people who started early on, 2012, 2013, 2014, who years down the road are still doing extremely well. You know, the, the power of that story for anybody who's listening here is not just the hope that through addressing some of these root factors, you can get better, but also you know, while it's encouraged that people find, let's say, 
a practitioner that can support them because some of these things like addressing mycotoxins or heavy metals or some of the deeper root issues require maybe a doctor or a functional medicine doctor to support you on them, at least at the more advanced stage. But for the vast majority of the things that she did, because you couldn't see her as a patient, she did them on her own in conjunction with her own doctor. And that's really telling of where medicine, because it's highly personalized, and also so many of these interventions to address these insults are lifestyle driven components, we can actually in a way start to become, it's always good to have a doctor, but we can start to become our own doctor in a way. And I really see that as the promise of your book. It's like, how can you start with these things here? And also laying out where you absolutely do need a doctor to be involved, but many of these things you can start just in your own home. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a great point. And you know, part of this, the second book addresses the things that came from the first book. So one of the things people said was, we want more details. Okay, we get it. You're telling us about all the science that happened in the lab and how you could translate this into humans, but we want details. What websites to go, what doctors to see, all that. So how that's much should I eat exactly on the keto flex diet? You know, what's exactly the way to think about exercise or sleep? Yeah, and what workarounds? If we can't do this part, what can we do instead? So one of the things we did that I was really excited about is we took, we have a unique combination of three people. So I actually wrote this in the handbook part that gives all the details. We did this with a patient who is actually doing this extremely successfully herself. This is Julie G who started the APOE4.info and with my wife, uh, Dr. Aida Lachine Bredesen, who is a clinician. And so we have a user who's doing very, very well and has gotten all the workarounds of doing the things and knows what, what has worked for her and what has worked less well for her. And she is APOE 4-4, as she describes in the book, uh, and had significant decline. And she's doing very, very well and scoring 98th, 99th percentile on cognitive tests repeatedly. And then my wife, who is really who introduced me to integrative medicine years ago and is very interested in this area. And then my start part for the, the neurology and the, and, the, and the molecular science. So these together, we kind of have a triad here that can give you the best of all three worlds. So I was really excited to do that. And then, as you mentioned, to show people that, look, you don't have to wait for decline. You can actually improve your current cognition and you can prevent the future decline. As you know, uh, over 80 million Americans have insulin resistance. So it's an incredibly common problem. And so it, is, it, it actually contributes in multiple ways. So if you break down the science, what you find is the thing that actually triggers this change. So APP, the amyloid precursor protein, sits at the center of this and is essentially uh, a master switch. So when things are good, much like the president of our country, when things are good, it sends out signals that say build new interactions, Things are, it's a growth period. So your growth and support, and that's what allows you to make and keep memories. On the other hand, this is, so this is about neuroplasticity. On the other hand, that same master switch molecule, APP, which sits in your neurons, especially at synapses, and to a lesser extent in non-neuronal cells. This is sampling the environment. And when things are bad, it's literally being cleaved and, and it's now sending out a different set of signals that say pull back. And by the way, the analogy is direct to what happened with the pandemic. So we, we had an insult, in that case, SARS. CoV-2, we were told, okay, we got to shelter in place. We got a social distance. So things pulled out. We went into a protective mode. And what happened? We ended up with a recession. The exact same thing is happening in your brain. When you have these various insults, then what happens is you change the signaling from one of growth and maintenance, keeping and making memories, to one of protection. You're now in a protective downsizing mode. You are losing synapses. Your brain is saying, I'm under assault. I can survive by being less of a brain. I'm going to be a smaller brain. I'm going to have fewer synapses. I'm not going to be able to have the same degree of neuroplasticity, but I will be able to survive. And so it's now making the amyloid that is killing, by the way, 
the bacteria and things like that. This was shown a number of years ago by professors Robert Moyer and Rudy Tanzi from Harvard. You look at the, the, so you look at this as a protective mode. Now, just as you said, as long as you keep the insult, you keep making that scab over and over, you keep, you keep uh, having the insults, you're going to downsize. So the insults come in four major groups, and you can literally trace the tracts through the molecular pathways of APP. So number one, anything with inflammation. So you tr if you trigger NF-kappa B, you are going to increase. NF-kappa B, of course, enters the nucleus, turns on hundreds of genes, and two of the ones that it turns on are the ones that make the A-beta, the beta secretase and the gamma secretase, which cut the APP to make more amyloid. It's saying, ouch, you know, I'm, I'm seeing inflammation, I'm going to deal with these pathogens. So that's anything inflammation. And that can be metabolic syndrome. It can be or poor dentition. It can be um, inflammation from chronic sinusitis. It can be uh, any sort of exposure to different pathogens, uh, leaky gut, all of the above. So that's the first one. The second one that's huge is because what toxicity. you're saying is that all that inflammation in the body, wherever it's starting, and we've right. done a bunch of episodes on, on dental health and how that's related to body Absolutely. inflammation. All that inflammation will ultimately make its way. It's not just in the body. What you do to right. the body, you do to the brain. Exactly. And I think one of the most important understandings is that the amyloid itself is part of the innate immune system. So when we talk about inflammation, we talk about things like NF-kappa B and cytokines and things like that, the amyloid is itself part of that response. So as long as you've got that ongoing inflammation, you're going to be making that amyloid. So just as people died from cytokine storm with COVID-19, people are dying from cytokine drizzle with Alzheimer's disease. Mm. It is creating over the years this cytokine drizzle. It's a slower process, it's a more chronic process, but it's the same idea. And so, yes, we've got to balance that. We've got to remove the source of that. We've got to first identify the source what is this? Is this P. gingivalis from your dentition? Is this uh, Lyme disease? You know, is this leaky gut? Is this chronic sinusitis? Is this mold? And whatever it is, we got to identify it. We've got to remove it. That's the key. And then, but absolutely, just as you people looked at using things like dexamethasone with COVID-19, you have to think about how can we also quiet down? So we like to use resolvins, for example, very helpful. But again, without removing the cause of it, you're gonna be in trouble down the road. So you've gotta look at both, what's causing it and then how to deal with what's being produced. That, so that's the first group. The second group, toxins. And they come in three different, uh, uh, three different subgroups, basically. Number one, anything that is an inorganic, things like mercury and things like air pollution. People who've been in the, in the California fires, it's a big issue just being exposed to that smoke. The people who were exposed to the World Trade Center, by the way, 14% of them developed cognitive decline by 15 years after that event. So it's a huge player in giving you increased risk for cognitive decline. Incredible. Very important. And then the second group is the organics. So things like glyphosate and toluene and benzene and formaldehyde and things like that. Acrolein, things, exposure to fumes from cars and things like that as well. Scented candles Scented. and things that are all over the place. The oh. fragrances that are there. Scary. It's yeah, exactly. Very scary. We often don't even know the full extent, the d damage that those scents do, Absolutely. even though it feels like we want to be surrounded by pleasurable scents you know, they're wreaking havoc on our body yeah. sometimes. Please be careful, yeah, over time. And then the third group is the biotoxins. So things like mycotoxins, trichothecenes, gliotoxin, uh, alpha toxin, things like that, aflatoxin, and, and things like okra toxin A, the, all of, the, of those can contribute. And the good news is, you know, many molds aren't making these toxins, but the kind of the, the classic ones, the, the stachybotrys and penicillium, aspergillus, ketomium, wallemia, those are the big five to, to be concerned about. So those are the, so, so it's inflammation, toxins. And then the other two are things that if you don't have enough of them, they're supportive things for your brain. And the first is energetics. So we have an equation and in the, in the denominator, in the numerator are the toxins and the inflammagens. In the denominator, energetics and trophic support. So for energetics, the big four things there, cerebral blood flow, oxygenation, so people who have sleep apnea, huge problem, huge increase in risk. 
dropping your oxygenation is huge. And of course, you can check it easily on your, you can check it on an iPhone, or you can check it on a watch, or you can check it many different ways to check your oxygenation. Um, get you know, an oximeter and look at night, for example. The third part there is mitochondrial function that you guys, of course, talk uh, so elegantly about frequently. And then the fourth one uh, is, the, um, is the actual burnable, combustible substrate, which in this case, ketones. So as Stephen Kinane taught us all a number of years ago, you've got a gap there. When you have Alzheimer's disease, you've got poor glucose utilization. That is the signature, the hallmark on a PET scan for Alzheimer's disease, and even for 10 years before a diagnosis, is temporal and parietal reduced glucose utilization. Well, the good news is you can bridge that gap with ketones. So with the combination, and if you can develop metabolic flexibility so that you can now burn both the fats and the, the glucose, you're in the best shape. So we want to do both. And so you can see when someone has insulin resistance, they are causing their own cognitive decline by multiple mechanisms. They're creating inflammation because of the non-enzymatic glycation of hundreds of proteins. They're also causing a resistance to, so that you now have reduced trophic support from insulin. When we would grow brain cells in a dish, which we did for 30 years in the lab, you'd always have to include some insulin there because you needed that to keep the cells alive. It is a very important neurotrophic activity. Things like nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and insulin are all critical for keeping neurons alive. So you're having this second mechanism as well. You're also having a metabolic component there. You're now losing, you not only have the insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance loss, but you're having the trophic problem as well. So you have a metabolic problem, a trophic problem, an inflammatory problem. You're really ticking most of the boxes to give yourself cognitive decline when you have insulin resistance. And then I should say the fourth piece of this then, the third beast being the low energetics, um, the fourth part of this then is trophic support. And those come in three groups. So it is growth factors, as I just mentioned, things like insulin and things like NGF and BDNF. But secondly, it is hormones. So having this is why estradiol in the past was noted to be a critical support. And a sudden loss of estradiol, as was shown by the Mayo Clinic group years ago, if you have a sudden loss of estradiol in your, if, at the age of 40 or younger, and you don't get HRT, then you are doubling your risk for Alzheimer's. Even though the Alzheimer's isn't coming till the future, you are increasing your risk starting at that time. And then the third of those three is nutrition. And so getting appropriate vitamin D and appropriate omega-3s and all these things, huge. So you look at those groups, and you can add to that stress, which is another piece of this. It's really a part of the trophic and metabolic piece because of its effect on things like cortisol and DHEA and pregnenolone and things like that. But those are the big groups. If you can optimize those four main groups, you are going to do a tremendous amount with preventing and reversing cognitive decline. And on the other hand, simply throwing a single drug at what you can see as quite a complex problem really doesn't make any sense. Our, our diseases have gotten way more sophisticated yeah. as our modern world has gotten way more sophisticated. Right. No longer is a single antibiotic or other intervention really the path forward. Yeah. The path forward is a multifaceted approach that deals at a root call at a root cause level that really is playing with systems biology. Yes. Right. So let's make this personalized. You know, we've teased a little bit that we were going to get into some of these stories. So I'd love to pick, you know, one of these stories and and one of them that comes to mind is um one of the women that was featured inside of the book, her name is Deborah. Right. And the interesting thing about Deborah that I think is so relevant to this topic of Alzheimer's is that 20 years ago, you would ask people and talk about the you know conversation of Alzheimer's and it was getting a lot more attention and awareness, but still right. for the most part, even a lot of clinicians would say, well, don't worry about that. That's something that you really have to deal with in your late seventies or eighties. Yeah. But tell us about Deborah and when she started experiencing some of the earliest signs and I'd also love to expand, you know, in these quadrants that you just broke out, inflammation, toxins, all these different areas. What were some of her unique root causes that led her to where she was? Yeah, that's a great point. So, you know, when I was training years ago, uh, we were taught that this is a disease 
Alzheimer's, it's really a disease of your 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. This is an old person disease. In fact, some people would call it old timer's disease instead of Alzheimer's disease. But what we now know about the underlying pathophysiology is that it starts at least 20 years before that. So what we thought of as a disease of your 60s, 70s, and 80s is really a disease of your 40s, 50s, and 60s that just gets diagnosed later. And in fact, people in their 30s sometimes have the beginnings of the pathophysiology. You can show PET scan changes in some people who are APOE4 positive even into their 20s. So in this case, Deborah, and I, I, I agree with you, that it was such a touching story uh, for me just to, to hear what Deborah went through. She's a very articulate attorney, and her dis description, she watched her grandmother die of Alzheimer's. She watched her father die of Alzheimer's disease, um, who in fact was a tremendous neurologist. And, and when, she, when he got lost and she had to literally drive the car and go find him out on the road somewhere, and she did finally manage to find him and get him home. And she said, you know, you really need to have an evaluation. Well, he knew exactly what was going on. And he turned to her and said, there's nothing that anyone can help me with. Wow. Uh, which was How heartbreaking. It, it was. And yet so many families that are watching this now or people that are listening to this have been through that experience, right? Yeah. Where somebody has no hope, yeah. especially people that are themselves in the medical field. Yeah. And and let me just stop and say something which, again, is a, a bit blasphemous, but it's the, it's the truth. This is now an optional disease. People should not have to get this disease. If you simply get on appropriate prevention when you turn 45, and if it's in your family, you can even do it a couple of years younger than that. Get yourself evaluated. Get yourself on optimal prevention and continue with optimal prevention. You need not be exposed to this illness. And unfortunately, the current standard of care is the opposite. They wait and the longer and longer and longer. In Deborah's case, she began to notice the same sort of problems that she'd seen in her father when she was in her 40s. So you're absolutely right. A number of the people in the stories said to themselves, wait a minute, you know, this can't be. I'm only in my 40s. But yes, this the changes begin that early. And she's a very sharp woman, very smart. So she noticed something's not right. And as she described in the book, uh, you know, one of the things uh, she, she went through and she was, uh, you know, she was going through with her car um, and trying to say that she was, you know, she was in a commuter lane uh, and she called out conference call. She started saying things that, that weren't quite the right thing. Um, she tried to call her dog and she, and she instead uh, yelled out what she was making for dinner. She knew something wasn't quite right. She couldn't, interestingly, she couldn't help her kids with their homework anymore. And here's a very smart woman, uh, you know, who graduated with, with uh, you know, with high honors uh, from Harvard, a very smart lady. And, 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 and one other anecdote to add to that, in some cases, she couldn't tell people apart. Right. So she, and one of the common things, because this is an area of the brain, the parietal lobe that is affected relatively early on, is that people will have this prosopagnosia. They'll have difficulty recognizing faces. And she had this and her father had it as well. She had this big time where she would go to some function and she had no idea. People would be coming up to her and saying, hey, you know, uh, should we should we talk about what we were talking about last week or whatever? She would not know who they were. She wouldn't know the names. She wouldn't know. And so she'd have to figure out things like, oh, if this person has an earring of this type on, you know, just on the left side or on both sides, or if they if they happen to wear a long red dress a lot, if they happen to be with, you know, a certain dog. So that she'd have certain things she would do to try to remember these people. And as she then, she went to, well, actually went to a major university where they told her, yes, you know, you're slipping, uh, you're not doing particularly well in your scores. And so then she ended up, it was her sister-in-law who had read about our studies and who then suggested that she get on the protocol. She got on it, and as most people do, it takes a few months as you start optimizing these various systems. And then, interestingly, she started documenting her own improvements. She started noticing. And she, one of the things that happened to her after several months, she went to school uh, for her kids. And then she said it was an incredible experience because she actually was able, she said not only did she know these people, but she knew that she knew them. <laughs> so she knew right away that it was rec instant recognition. She knew the faces. She knew the names. So she could see such a huge change in her own ability to source, her own ability to call uh, into her, into usefulness, the information that she needed, which is what happens when you're optimizing things. 
tell me a, a little bit about whether it's her story or some of the other individuals at the first sign of hope where they start to notice a shift yeah that no not only are they no longer regressing but they're actually getting back some of their brain function memory you know one of the things that people deal with a lot is skepticism right T tell us a little bit about that and some of the stories that that you have documented here does anything come to mind of about a person or the types of skepticism that people face from even their own providers that are that are trying to take care of them yeah. in terms of whether or not they're actually making progress it's a great point i mean there, there's always that question like wait is this really true and, and i want to just go back quickly and I, you, you you had asked about her some of her specifics yes please. And yes in her case she had vascular issues um, with some lipid changes she had hormonal issues and she actually had some toxin associated issues so she, and, and as with many people they often have this combination of things now it may be that one is more important than the others for, for many people but the bottom line is most people have multiple contributors to their cognitive decline so therefore it's really important to identify these but just as you said as they begin to notice their improvement at first they don't want to trust it and if they mention it to their doctor their doctor will say ah oh, you know nothing helps this disease just you know you're fooling yourself this is placebo effect something like that so in her case as she finally after about 10 months went back to the same university that had not participated in any way in treatment, had it only participated in showing her that she was going downhill. And so she was retested. And they, they said to her, what have you been doing? You're, you're testing much better than you were before. And she said, well, I've been doing this protocol. And of course, as, as many researchers do, they want to know the one thing. So they say, well, can you just now take away some, you know, take away one thing at a time because we want to know what's giving you this effect. Right. And so, was it like <laughs> this, you know, specific dosage of something? Was yeah. it this drug that they included in? Mm -hmm. And I mean, many of your participants in your trial know firsthand because, you know, part of this book is also showcasing the, the challenges with doing doing a protocol, right? Yeah. Yeah. S making progress and slipping back a little bit and the unique uh, you know, unique circumstances that are required yeah. to continue and maintain this life if you want to continue to get some of the, the benefits. So many of them are trained to know, like, it's not just one thing. Right. It's the entire approach right. that makes the difference. And this is no different than saying, hey, you know, I, I had no one in the orchestra pit. Do you, do you, am I going to add the timpani or am I going to add the clarinets? What's going to make it an orchestra? No, you have to add the orchestra. You have to have all the different instruments. And then the idea of, well, now let's take away the violins and see if it still sounds like an orchestra. No, it's no longer an orchestra. You have to have the whole thing to make it sound right. Or right. if you try to fly, fly a plane, you yeah. know, let's get rid of the, you know, Let's get to the left wing, exactly. right? Let's get rid of the right engine or yes. something like that. Sure, you might be able to truck along for a little bit, yeah. but you're not going to be able to continue. You're ultimately going to be able to crash. And I think that this is such a fundamental shift that's happening now in medicine that yes. as diseases have gotten more complicated, there is more openness and awareness. It's slow. It's very slow. But as yeah. you mentioned, you originally got rejected with your trial because right. it was multivariate. How did you convince the powers to be to ultimately understand that this was a huge part of documenting any progress when it came to this chronic disease? How did you ultimately so, show them that you need to have a multivariate approach? You know, this is such a good point. So we were turned down in 2011. So we thought, okay, we need to have anecdotes. Let's show a bunch of anecdotes because we had nothing back then. So we published the first anecdotes, 10 people with nine of them improving in 2014. We had another 10 in 2016. We published 100 anecdotes. In all cases, we had we had documented improvement, approval in 2018. So then after we had that, we thought, okay, 100. They can't turn us down again. We went back in 2018. We got turned down again. Because again, you know, this is not the way people think about clinical trials. We need to now start giving the brain its due. It is a complicated organ. And we need to start thinking of these as complex network insufficiencies. These are network insufficiencies. People are used to hearing about deficiency of vitamin D or of vitamin C. Those are simple insufficiencies. We now need to come into the 21st century and realize that many of our illnesses are complex network insufficiencies. And Alzheimer's is a great example. This is a complex network that has to do with your hormones and has to do with your trophic factors. So we finally we, we went to a fourth different IRB 
that finally in 2019 said, okay, we'll let you do a small proof of concept trial, which is what we just completed in December of 2020, and which is what we posted on MedArchive uh, this year, and now we're just submitting for peer-reviewed publication. But it's already public now, uh, so that you can read the whole thing in MedArchive. I think something very important about this, and again, if people are not in the world of research, and I'm not in it myself, but I get to talk to incredible people like yourself that are in it, is when people hear about your work, you know, I often hear about a couple things. It's like, okay, where's the big randomized controlled trial, right? You hear this all the time, even yeah. from peers yep. of yours, colleagues of, of yours that are out there that's like, okay, I'll believe it when we have a randomized control, big randomized control trial. But research happens in stages and there's different approval processes. And part of that is you have small showcases and proof of concept trials that then allow for the momentum to build up, the approvals to come in, and also funding, right? Because these trials are expensive to do and you gradually build your way up. If somebody's ready to hand and give you the approval of, you know, $100 million to be able to do a much, much bigger trial, amazing. But this happens in stages. And that's why this whole idea of like, where's a big randomized control trial is really a lazy argument against the work. You know, it's so interesting. You know, people will try to sound intelligent by saying, well, I, I don't believe it because there's not a ran big randomized controlled trial yet. But that's saying I haven't taken the time to look at what's available currently versus what's coming out of the, the studies you have published. And in fact, if you look at what's available, when there's nothing available, something is better than nothing. It's always easy to say, oh, I want to see a big... And when, once we finish publishing the randomized control trial, they'll say we want to have two randomized control trial, whatever. So we've gone from anecdotes to more anecdotes to proof of concept trial. And all of these have worked far better than anything else that's been published. And so, yes, now we've gone to the next step, which is a randomized controlled trial. The thing that really takes us by surprise, I have to admit, is the toxin exposure. When we started this work, we had no idea that this was a critical and incredibly common contributor to Alzheimer's. So what happened was, we started back in 2012, we were really looking at what became type 1, type 1.5, and type 2, improving the support, improving the trophic factors, improving hormones, reducing inflammation, improving insulin sensitivity. We had a set of people that just didn't respond, and we wanted to understand what was going on. And I actually started by calling some of the spouses and saying, you know, let's find out where did this person grow up? You know, what's going on with their lives? What are the genetics? You know, what's contributed to this problem? And they also looked different. That's been the surprise. People who have toxins as part of their Alzheimer's often will present instead of amnestically with your typical, I can't learn new information. They'll often have, I'm having trouble with organizing things. I'm having trouble learning my new iPhone. I'm having trouble at my job. I'm having trouble with calculations. I'm having trouble with visual recognition. I'm having trouble with spatial orientation. All of these non-amnestic presentations. They often will have depression as one of the problems at the beginning. And these people turned out to have exposure to three different types of toxins. So you've got to look at the inorganics, things like metals, and you know the story of air pollution. That's turned out to be more and more common as a cause. So be careful out there on the freeways. Don't get too much of that air pollution you know, into your lungs and ultimately to your brains. Then second one, organics, things like formaldehyde and toluene and glyphosate, all these various organic toxins that we are exposed to. These are critical. And as an example, someone who had many, many years of exposure to a paraffin candle burning um, developed cognitive decline. So be careful about these organics. And we've seen these where these sneak up on people. They don't know about their exposure. They don't realize their glutathione has become low trying to fight this stuff. They don't realize that they've got this stuff in depots in their body. And one of the things that, that happens is as you approach menopause or andropause, as you know, you're now changing the way you're dealing with your bone. You have a little more on the, uh, on the osteoclastic side. You're releasing this stuff back into the bloodstreams. And so many, many of these people 
are presenting late 40s to late 50s in that decade with beginning cognitive changes at that time. And they have various organics or the third group, biotoxins. I've been shocked to see how common it is for people to come in with cognitive decline that turns out to have as a major contributor toxins that are produced by mold species. And as you know, it's typically the big five. It's not all mold species. It's the stachybotrys, the penicillium, the aspergillus, ketomium, and wallemia. Those are the big five. So if you've got those running around your basement, around your house, if you've got black mold in your house or you haven't taken care of that mold problem, please check to see, first of all, check your ERMI score. Um, that is your EPA relative mold index, or you can use another score called Hurts Me Too. They're both fine. And they will look at whether in fact you've got mold, those mold species especially within your home or place of work. And then look to see whether in fact you've got evidence of these mycotoxins. You can do this looking at responses made in your blood, looking at whether you've got these in your sinuses, because they sometimes will actually grow, the, the molds themselves will grow in the sinuses. We have Take people with nasal chronic sinuses. Microbiome. Absolutely. And that's, as you know, that's another huge player. And looking at oral microbiome, another big one that wasn't clear years ago, becoming more and more clear, sinus microbiome, and then of course, gut microbiome all huge. And of course, the brain microbiome has turned out to be a surprise that we were always taught that the brain should be a sterile organ, right? <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's still controversial. We don't know if that's the norm. But what we do know is if you look at the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease, what do you see in there? You mm. see oral, you see oral bacteria such as P. gingivalis and T. denticola. You see mold species. You see fun, fungal species such as some of the candida species. You see things like Borrelia, spirochetes, things like that. Uh, and you see viruses, herpes simplex, HHV6A being two of the, the most common ones. These are all critical things, and you're responding to this invasion by making the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. So again, it comes back to supporting your immune system and things like that. So the big surprise, these three different groups of toxins, you're living in them, you don't know it, no one bothers to check, and then you come down with cognitive decline, and then typically people still don't check. But if you, if you bother to look, you will see that these are contributing factors. So all of us can do better by checking these things when we're younger and minimizing them. Getting on basic detox is so huge, as you know. It's so true. And I think a, a huge part of it, as you're really talking about, is, is awareness. And yeah, the more awareness that you have, the more likely it is that you can actually uh, start to look in this direction because we know from the World Health Organization and a lot of building surveys that are there, it's, it's estimated that two-thirds of buildings in North America could have mold inside of them at some degree that's harmful for human health. But if we look at even the real estate game as a whole, mm -hmm. you know, all the mold inspectors are not really trained and not incentivized to be looking for mold. In fact, they want to, you know, give give simple enough checks and a lot of the mold that's there is not viewable to the eye, to the naked eye. It's not black mold immediately that you can see. Sometimes it's the case. It's behind the dishwasher and there's a mold colony that's there that's been there since the last homeowner had it. Or if you're renting an apartment, you know, I'm here in Santa Monica, a friend of mine just came back and said, how do I even see the level of mold that's in my house? Because I'm having memory issues. I'm having other stuff. I'm having sinus things. I eat healthy. I wear like a glucose monitor. I'm doing all these things that are there, but yeah. I still feel like something is going on. And you mentioned the ERMI test. That's yeah. a, that's an air test that people can get done and then can look up ERMI in their, in their area. But it's almost like what I love about what you just shared is that you're giving people permission and encouragement to go and look for these items. Increasingly since the industrial revolution, we are living in a more toxic world. And these toxins are taking and wreaking major havoc on our health. Even as you mentioned with COVID-19, one of the primary uh, correlators with COVID-19 in many of these uh, cities has been air pollution that they've found. 
people yeah. that are exposed to heavy amounts of air pollution uh, that comes from, you know, not just cars, but indoor off gassing. These are all factors that play a role. And the, the key is as overwhelming as it can be, because sometimes it feels like a lot. There's this mold issue. There's this heavy metal and that. It's that we can get started somewhere and we can start with the basics and work our way up. Not so that we address all these insults at once, but we can find the ones that are key to us. So actually, that's a great question to ask you. You know, part of the book, um, the End of Alzheimer's program, is helping people get clear on maybe where they can get started first for them. So how do people think about that? When you're talking to people who are about to embark the program, how are they beginning to lay out the chips and at least even start where, at least decide where to get started? Yeah, that's a, you know that's a great point. And you know you can think of this like you know you're sitting in your home for example, and you know there's a fire out there and it's it's advancing toward you. Well, if you can put it out when it's out there and kind of put, push it back, then in fact it's less likely to come to your house. Once it gets to your house, you know you've got a lot of things to do, but you can get rid of it while it's out there. At least beat it back and really buy yourself you know decades potentially. And we should have people who are you know good cognition until they're a hundred. So you can get started in a number of ways. There's the basics, and then there are the things that are targeted. On the basics, there is diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, basic detox, and some basic supplements. So those, what we think of as kind of the seven core features, and we talk about these uh, in the book as well. So just getting yourself into a plant-rich, mild, ketotic diet with some fasting. You know, fasting has turned out to be so remarkably helpful for everything from hypertension to cognition to preventing, uh, helping in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease uh, to, you know, improving vascular status, improving insulin sensitivity, you know, on and on and on. So just doing basics like that, and we go into great detail in the book for specific things to buy, specific things for the so-called KetoFlex 12-3 diet, then uh, exercise, just basic things with both strength training and aerobic training, sleep, as I mentioned, that may be the, the most overlooked. People don't bother to check to see if they have nocturnal hypoxia, and it's incredibly common. Um, and, and then the best course, way to check that is through a sleep center? You can do it. Yeah, actually, it's pretty easy now. You can actually do uh, just get yourself an oximeter. And there are a number of good oximeters out there that can actually record for you um, your oxygenation. So again, this is something more and more health we're seeing as quantified self. You know, now you can have your Apple Watch and you can, you can look at things. You can look at your heart rate. You can look at your oxygen saturation. And by the way, you can look at your oxygen saturation, you know, at a moment's notice with your iPhone. Uh, that's, that's simple to do. But if you want to record it all night, um, you want to have an oximeter. And yes, you can get this from your doctor. You can, as you said, you can do a sleep study, but you can also do it more simply by just recording it with an oximeter and then see if you're dropping below that, that target of 96 to 98%. Uh, percent. And then again, stress. Um, incredible. As you know, there are now spikes. And when I got an interesting email from a neurologist yesterday who's seeing a spike in her practice, uh, looking at people with cognitive decline. They, everyone's anxious, everyone's stressed out, everyone's indoors, everybody's depressed and worried. There's so much going on in the world right now. And of course, this contributes to everything from hypertension to cognitive decline. So getting that, and just I, again, as a scientist, I never thought I would be talking about things like meditation. I thought this is, you know, not helpful. And yet I can't deny the statistics are there. The publications are there. Neuroplasticity is undoubtedly enhanced with forms of meditation like TM, like mindfulness, like things like that. So this is really important. And then brain training. Again, each one of these things isolated doesn't have a huge impact. But as part of an overall program, these are getting you over that hump. These are making it so that you are now on the right side of plasticity so that you are able to lay down and keep new synapses. And then some basic detox. And I'm, you know, I'm learning this myself with detoxing myself with during the COVID-19. One of the things I started doing was using chronometer a lot more. So I'm looking every day at what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, how much fiber I have, how much protein I have, all these sorts of things. And critical to that is getting appropriate 
fiber, which turns out to be so helpful for detox, among other things, for improving your glycemic uh, load from various uh, foods and things like that, improving your insulin sensitivity, uh, and to improving your lipid numbers. So these things are all helpful. And then basic things like uh, filtered water, uh, sweating frequently, following up with uh, non-emollient soaps and things like that, or non-toxic soaps. Uh, all of these things critical for keeping your toxin level low. HEPA filters, um, I encourage people, especially if there's any question about molds, of course you wanna have remediation, but also you wanna have a HEPA filter. Um, improve the air where you are living, you know, you, it will be helpful. And you mentioned earlier, people get overwhelmed. Just to know, if you have water intrusion in your home, if you have a history of water damage, you're likely to have some mold issues. If you've truly had, from the very beginning, there's never been any water intrusion, uh, which is relatively uncommon, most of us have had some of that, then you're probably in pretty good shape. But if you've ever had any water damage, and we have people, by the way, who will start to get better and then have a leak in their home, and literally they can tell their cognition will signal the leak in the home faster than the spouse will find it so that they will actually go downhill within 24 hours and then they'll start looking oh yeah here's new new water intrusion that we were unaware of so this is a this is a surprising and important correlation so these are some of the basic things that you can use to get started and there are some basic supplements i know mark talks about these a lot but even you know things that that uh, look at things like your uh, insulin sensitivity some you know basic detox, making sure that you have enough. And I would say one of the common ones that people leave out is choline. Uh, males should have about 550 milligrams per day of choline or more. Females, 450 milligrams or more. And we talk about this in the book. And I find uh, that just about every day, I am a little on the low side with choline. We don't tend to get as much choline as we should. And, and most, most people, people the are choline poor. that they're getting is through like eggs? Occasionally some eggs, some liver, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need to do a better job of that. And that's, you, 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 know, you can certainly support that, um, not only with things like pastured eggs and stuff, but also with things like citicoline. Uh, or with GPC choline, um, some easy ways to get yourself to make sure that you're getting uh, that, that 550 milligrams, or if you're a female, uh, 450 milligrams. Uh, most of us are low. And, and of course, this is the precursor for acetylcholine, which is the most important neurotransmitter for storing memory and making memory. So <clears throat> you need appropriate acetylcholine. You also need appropriate glutamate for getting the appropriate memories. And there are other pieces to this as well, uh, you know, such as uh, uh, nor uh, noradrenaline, norepinephrine, um, which, are, which are key for, for level of, uh, 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 of attention uh, and, uh, and level of consciousness. Um, and then things like dopamine, which of course are important for that reward uh, feeling. So all of these work together, but acetylcholine is, is the most important one. And of course, this is why people take uh, Aricept, which inhibits breakdown of acetylcholine to give themselves that little boost when they have Alzheimer's disease. But of course, it doesn't work by itself terribly well. So I encourage everybody, please make sure that you are not choline deficient. Make sure that you are not vitamin D deficient. You know, make sure that you are not deficient in, in important hormones and trophic factors that are critical for laying down and keeping memory storage. And then beyond that, you want to do targeting. As we said earlier, you know, looking at the key things that are driving this. If you've got toxins around that you're unaware of, which so many of us do, let's find out, you know, before the fire gets to your house, let's find out because this thing is brewing. And by the way, the same thing is being reported in Parkinson's disease. People who didn't realize that they had long-term exposure to things like trichloroethylene and glyphosate and Agent Orange and, uh, you know, and on and on and on, things that are inhibitors of complex one especially. These are things 
that increase your risk for Parkinson's disease. So these things are brewing for years. And if we're aware of them before they actually make major impacts, you only get the symptoms late in the disease. And again, that's another part of 21st century medicine that's not emphasized enough. What we see as disease is the end stage of a chronic process that's been going on for decades. The good news is, and as Mark has championed for years, we can now check these things. We, we can check these diseases before they strike us symptomatically. So we should all be aware of the pre-symptomatic stages. Are you in a pre-symptomatic stage of Parkinson's? Are you in a pre-symptomatic stage of what will ultimately be Alzheimer's? Are you in a pre-symptomatic stage of heart disease? And on and on. That's the good news on the chronic illnesses. We can see them coming. The bad news is that people have not been doing that. So that when they finally get a diagnosis, this is a fairly late stage, and we really have to work hard now, not only to get rid of the drivers, but then to rebuild. And I, but I do think there are some great things coming with stem cells for helping us to rebuild these lost synapses. And I think that will be a part of the overall. We've had people already go on the program and then add stem cells and get an additional bump. So I think we're gonna see more and more of that. Using stem cells alone is a little bit like trying to rebuild the house as it's burning down. Let's put out the fire first, then we try to rebuild the house as opposed to trying to do that you know, as it's still on fire. Stem cells and some of these advanced therapies that are available to us now that really technology is making available, they're like icing on the cake, right? Absolutely. But we still need a foundational, yeah base that we want to build on, which is all these dietary lifestyle recommendations that many individuals can, um, can get a chance to, to follow. So Absolutely. For, some, for somebody who's listening now may have some history of cognitive decline in their family, some family members that have had Alzheimer's because it's so prevalent, um, and they're in their, let's say, 50s or, or 60s, and they're not seeing that they you know, they're not maybe noticing or what they see as like, they're not sure if they're having cognitive decline or not. And they want to get the first step, which is sort of just assessing where they are, right? How bad are things? Have they just gotten used to their memory falling a little bit here and there, or is actually something more serious going on? What would you recommend for them as the first step of options? Is it doing that, um, uh, basically, uh, I forgot the term, but the similar cognitive uh, test that you said that's similar to like a colonoscopy? Cognoscopy, exactly. Cognoscopy. Right. And you can actually, yeah, you can, you can now you know, get this you know, directly. So yeah, very good point. And I think you know, if we're going to impact the global burden of dementia, if we're going to take these 45 million Americans who are going to get Alzheimer's and reduce that as close to zero as we can, we need to have everybody think about this and get on prevention. And I would break these into two groups. And I think it's important to mention a group that's, that's rarely mentioned. So 95% of people who develop Alzheimer's have sporadic Alzheimer's. So in other words, it's not in the genes that you're going to have. Yes, they may have increased risk with ApoE4, which is the common one. And there are dozens of genes that increase your risk, but ApoE4 is the common and, and striking one. If you have a single copy of ApoE4, uh, it increases your risk from about 9% through your lifetime to 30%. If you have two copies, it's well over 50%. So that's an important one for sure. And there are about se about 75 million Americans who have a single copy. And again, none of these people should be getting Alzheimer's disease. And there are about 7 million who have two copies. And again, starting early, none of them. But I want to mention the small segment. F about 5%, just under 5% of the people who develop Alzheimer's have familial Alzheimer's. And there has been nothing for these people in the past, and drug approaches have failed with this group. And so they just know if they have the gene, and this is typically three genes, mutations in APP, presenilin-1, or presenilin-2. So for those people, and they often will get symptoms in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, very significant symptoms. It comes on early. They know it'll, it'll hit the parents. You know, Half of the siblings will get it. It's a dominantly inherited gene. I would encourage them, please get on all the appropriate things for prevention. Get evaluated, get on that 
in your 20s. Because again, you may be getting symptoms in your 30s or 40s. So start as early as you can and really optimize everything. There is a real opportunity here, I think, for the first time to have impacts. We'll see. There are some people who are already doing this. We'll see how it goes. Now, for people who are not in that group, which is the vast majority, um, then for them, I, I would encourage them to start when they're in their early 40s. So we usually say, you know, 45, that's fine. If you've got a family history that starts young, then a little earlier than that. And you want to know your status on the basics. Do you have ongoing inflammation? Do you have ongoing insulin resistance or glycotoxicity? Do you have specific trophic factors, hormones, or nutrients that are low? Do you have specific toxins? Do you have vascular component? We see a number of people where that's the major problem. And as you know, they get hypertension. They may even have uh, a little suggestion of a stroke or a, or a TIA. They get thrown on statins. They have these low cholesterols. And they're, then over time, they're not perfusing their brains the way they should. These are the people who actually will do well with things like EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy help perfuse, help you to do the right things and get that, you know, you want to get the oxygen, but you want to get the blood flow as well. And then do you have histories of trauma? All of these things are critical. Find out where you stand and then get on an optimal protocol to address those things, starting with the basics. And people will say, oh, this is just about lifestyle. Well, no, it's about the things that are actually driving the decline. And of course, you want to include lifestyle. Why would you throw that out? That is an important contributor. The old idea from when I was in, back in medical school years ago was that, oh, you know, it's not that important. You know, eat some food, get, you know, get some protein, but it's not a big deal. Uh, it was mostly much, focused uh, on, on weight loss, if anything. Yeah. It was just keep your weight you know, not too, too high. It's, yeah, it's all about prescribing the right drug. Well, it turns out, of course, that getting at these upstream contributors is actually more important. The drugs are going to be important. I believe that drugs for Alzheimer's will be helpful, but they should be used on the backbone of this foundation of the things that are driving the process. Then you can target your drug. And, you know, there have been over 400 different trials for Alzheimer's that have failed. Virtually, and in some case, made people's situation worse off. Exactly. So it's not just that the drugs aren't helping. In some cases, they're actually hurting, at least so far. Maybe ultimately, they'll add and we'll be figure out a way to integrate them more with protocols like yours that are there. But at least so far, it's either nothing or making the situation worse. That's so true. And I should mention, just in the last couple of days, yet another drug has failed, and that was intranasal insulin. So the idea was, let's give you intranasal insulin, get it into your brain. The good news about intranasal uh, a, a delivery of things like nerve growth factor and things like that is that you can get them into the brain. Glutathione, another one, you can deliver it, deliver intranasally into the brain. So the idea was, okay, your insulin signaling is not perfect. Let's just add insulin. Now, again, you know, we recognize it's the insulin resistance. You don't overcome insulin resistance by just giving more insulin. That is an overly simplistic way. We want to improve the insulin signaling, not just give a big, you know, a, a, a big pocket of, of insulin. Uh, and so this failed, unfortunately, it did not show any improvement whatsoever um, in cognition. So yet another you know, monotherapy that has failed. And the, the drugs have been used the wrong way. I think when, when they're used appropriately with the backbone of getting at the drivers and then targeting the things that are still there, for example, targeting uh, specific toxins that may be there, um, enhancing some of the cholinergic transmission, fine. But doing that alone is not addressing the various pieces that are making this network dysfunction. So I think, that, again, that there will be a place for these, but it will be on the backbone of of looking at the drivers. In these people, we typically find multiple contributing factors from just the thing, pathogens, as we talked about, toxins, reductions in, in energetic support and reductions in trophic support. And it's addressing those things. You're now pushing the people onto the correct side of the signal. You're literally changing neurochemical signaling 
from a synaptoclastic signaling, which is pulling down, just as you think about osteoclastic activity in osteoporosis. This is synaptoporosis. That's what Alzheimer's is. So you're now changing from synaptoclastic signaling into synaptoblastic signaling, building up and maintaining those synapses, which is just what we want to do. It's, it's so key because as, as we are talking about this, I think that's an important point because, yes, we've done so many episodes on the importance of diet. We've done right, so many episodes right. on the importance of sleep. But specifically with Alzheimer's, what you've shown through your research and work is that, okay, there could be people that their diet is pretty decent. Exactly. Right? Or there could be people that their sleep is pretty good, but they have such deep environmental toxicity exposures, which they wouldn't have known of if they didn't right. go to one of the physicians that's in your network, that's right. trained in the Bredesen protocol and the Recode protocol, and then found out their unique stressor that's yes. maybe one of the biggest ones for them. Right. It's definitely multifaceted, but everybody has a big one or you know, not big, just one. There's a big few um, right. that are there that are the biggest pushes for them. Were yeah, there absolutely. any of the stories that are a good example of how for one of those survivors, um, one, you know, one of those key quadrants was a bigger pusher for them than for some of the others that were there. Is there anyone that comes Absolutely. to mind sure. that you could share? So Sally is a great example. And Sally was trained um, as a nursing professor and taught for years. One of the things that she taught people was that uh, Alzheimer's is untreatable. There's nothing we can do about this illness. And unfortunately, she started to develop this herself. Um, and it really also had you know, her very first symptoms, um, probably in her early 50s, but really nothing enough to push her until she was in her late 60s. And she started having trouble. She would forget to pick up her grandchildren. Um, she had problems with executive function, with you know, planning and carrying out specific tasks and things like that. And so she went in and she was told, so she, they actually did a, an amyloid PET scan and show, first of all, they found she was APOE4 positive. So she had the common Alzheimer related gene risk factor that 75 million Americans have one copy, which she did. Um, and about 7 million uh, Americans have two copies. And unfortunately, if you got, if you got zero copies, 9% lifetime risk, which is not too high, but it's not zero. If you've got a single copy of APOE4, it's about 30%. If you got two copies, it's well over 50%. So she was in a high risk group. She then had an amyloid scan that was positive. So they put her on a drug trial. And in fact, it was an anti-amyloid drug. So they said, let's remove the amyloid that's in your brain. With each injection of the antibodies, she would get much worse. And we've seen this now in a number of people. Again, if you understand that this is a protective response of your brain, as long as you've got the exposure, no surprise that when you get this reduced, you're going to do worse. Fortunately for her, because we've seen other people that just kept on the trials and got worse and worse and worse, after this had happened to her four times, she said, I'm not doing this anymore. This is clearly making me worse. She then heard about the, wor the work that we're doing. She started on the protocol. Uh, sh her MOCA score was 24. She then, uh, at, over time, um, is getting a perfect 30 repeatedly. She's done very, very well. It turned out in her particular case, the big contributor was mycotoxins. She had lived, unfortunately, and so many of us do, live in houses that are full of these molds that are making specific toxins. Now, some people are lucky enough, if they happen to have mold in the house, it's not making mycotoxins. In her cases, it was. And so now just And, and slowly, just for context to add in, sorry to cut you off, yeah, yeah. these mycotoxins are basically ways that molds protect yes. and sort of fight for their territory. So they're poisons that they excrete right. to fight for real estate. And that's part of their, they don't have claws, they don't have fangs, they don't have teeth. So these mycotoxins are poisons and they're part of their arson right. to get rid of other competing um, uh, life forms yes. to fight for real estate. That's a really good point. So what happens is if you're a mold, you don't grow as quickly as the bacteria around you. So you're going to get squeezed out of your environment if you don't find a way to fight off the bacteria that are trying to grow around you. Of course, that's why penicillin occurred. They're fighting off the bacteria around them. So unfortunately, some of these mycotoxins, these toxins produced by the molds, are, they're volatile. They, they get in the air. The, the spores get in the air. 
Um, and we and often they'll actually even grow in our sinuses or in our GI tract. They're making these toxins, and the toxins, unfortunately, impact our brains. They impact our immune systems. They impact uh, ca cancer. They increase our risk for cancer in some cases. They can damage our kidneys. So there are all sorts of problems. You get rashes. So your body now is trying to fight back. So you get this unfortunate chronic inflammatory response syndrome, first described, of course, by Dr. Richie Shoemaker. And this is a, it is a chronic, so it's a long-term inflammatory response to these toxins, and as he pointed out, to many other things that occur in the water-damaged buildings that typically are the support systems for these molds. And so it's you know volatile organic compounds and little fragments of cell walls and all sorts of things that your body is now responding to. And unfortunately, just having a relatively poor immune system, not having good resilience, all of the things um, that, we, that, that happen to us because of our poor lifestyles and the processed food, all this sort of stuff. These set us up not only to have a poor outcome in COVID-19, but to have a poor outcome when we are exposed to the molds and the mycotoxins. And so this is a very common problem, a very common contributor to cognitive decline, and unfortunately, not even recognized by standard of care medicine. So if you say to someone, oh, you, you know, you're developing early Alzheimer's, uh, you better see if you've got mycotoxin exposure. Um, you go to a standard you know, memory center, they'll laugh you out of the room and just say, well, you know, we don't recognize that uh, as a contributor. Well, you know, you better start recognizing it as a contributor because it's unfortunately a relatively common contributor and you do need to address it. And I published a paper a number of years ago saying, you know, this is really an unrecognized and treatable epidemic. This is all over the place. And so it, that's what ended up happening to Sally. As she started to treat it, she started to get better. And as I mentioned, her scores are now perfect. She's doing great. She continues on the protocol. And it comes back to what you said earlier also. Um, she's dealing with the issue of, you know, what do I pay for? What is appropriate here? I don't want to go overboard. It is expensive. On the other hand, the alternative of a nursing home is many, many times more expensive. And of course, the alternative of this new drug, Aduhelm, is also many, many times more expensive and doesn't work nearly as well. So that's the unfortunate alternative. It, it, it's really, we we think that this approach can sometimes be expensive, but as you said, you know, we're here in Santa Monica at our studio recording. There's a very famous memory care center that's just right down yeah. the street from here that I've been with a few friends to volunteer a few times and go spend time with some of the patients that are there at the memory center. And uh, it's well known because uh, one of our past presidents, uh, Ronald Reagan, right. was uh, an individual who was staying there at one point in time. And I remember uh, as we were going on a tour, a few of my friends who went to go volunteer, they were like, oh, you know, let's show you around and we'll show you like the room that, you know, Ronald Reagan was in um, when he was getting uh, treated. Mm. And uh, it's a nice place and we're by the beach and, you know, everything like that. It's Santa Monica, California, right? Yeah. Things are a little bit more expensive. And I remember walking into uh, the room and it was a very small room, like a very, very modest room. Nice, but extremely modest. And they told me the price at the time, you know, rough range that somebody would be paying. Yeah. And most likely the president, probably former president paid himself when he was there. I mean, these are astronomical right. numbers right. to have 24-hour care, to have a parent, a grandparent, uh, yourself at a memory care center, and not to mention that the the drug, Aduhelm, right, that's been in the news a little right. bit, um, you know, the price tag that's been floating around that potentially could have bankrupted us in the economy was, I believe it was like $56,000 a year. And that's just the beginning because you still have to pay for infusions. You still have to pay for PET scans. You have to pay for uh, for uh, MRIs. You've got to have before and after MRIs because of the fact that it causes bleeding into the brain in about 17% of people. It causes uh, side effects in about 40 to 50% of people, depending on whether you're APOE4 negative or positive. So it really comes with some huge side effects. And in fact, we'd like to do in the, in the upcoming trial, we'd like to use that as the control. Right. Um, the problem is gonna be, we'll then have to be very careful about, are we actually hurting these people? with giving them some cerebral hemorrhage and giving them some some edema in the brain. Um, is, is that fair to them to give them that sort of side effects as a control group? 
What we'd like to be able to do instead, and as you indicated, the, the costs are just astronomical. Um, the average person, just, just the average person, $350,000 before they pass away from Alzheimer's disease, much of which, of course, is, is spent with nursing homes. That can often be you know, $100,000 a year or more. It's really unfortunate. So what we'd like to be able to say is, look, everybody, please get on appropriate prevention when you turn 45 or get on appropriate reversal when you have the earliest possible symptoms. And we can really make this an optional disease. I mean, this is the power of podcasts and books like yourself is that really we're sounding the alarm that this is something that is both. Again, some people are going to really have challenge with the statement, but it's true. Even though you have challenges with it, you're saying that this is an optional disease now. Now that what we know, you know, this is an optional di disease. And that is the truth of the matter. And on top of that, we don't have to wait till you have an official diagnosis right. to start to make changes that are there. Now, just going back to Sally's story, for example, help us understand a little bit and paint a picture for those that are listening. What was the process of actually her getting treated? You know, right. who was she working with and interfacing with and how did her traditional care fit into that model? Great point. So she worked with a physician who was interested enough to read about this. Um, and to then begin to get her on an appropriate protocol. So what did she do? She went on to a, essentially the shoemaker protocol in which she took specific binders so that she could actually remove the toxins that were within her. She also reduced her ongoing inflammation from these. She ultimately then had the intranasal VIP that was part of the shoemaker protocol. So she used basically a physician who learned this who you know educated himself? You know we are so much, so often we talk about continuing medical education, um, and yet so many physicians are resistant to learning something new. They feel very comfortable with writing a prescription. Then of course, unfortunately, many of them are told you don't have time to do more than just quick evaluation and prescription. Fortunately, for in her case, the doctor was willing to learn this sort of approach to apply it to her. And then, this is so important, continue to optimize. And I think this is one of the things that we don't think about enough. As people are beginning to treat these complex illnesses, you've got to keep your finger on the pulse. Did they do a little better? Did they do a little worse? Do we need to change something? Do we need to change a dose? Do we need to now add something? Uh, often continuing to optimize is the most important thing. And this is, of course, where health coaches have been so helpful to help people to get on the right path and to keep optimizing. Because this, again, it's not something simple you're dealing with. This is a complex system. So you kind of have to wind your way um, through a, a labyrinthine sort of protocol to make sure that you're optimizing things for best outcomes. And they'll find that as they change one thing after another, they start seeing better and better results. And the physician she worked with, again, just expanding out and helping people understand a little bit of yeah. your world and all the things that you're involved with, this physician was trained in your protocol. Right. Right? So, so tell, talk a little bit about how many physicians are out there that are trained in this and what that process looks like and how many of them, including some people that have been on the podcast before, contribute to the larger research and case studies that you're pulling together as an organization. Yeah, that's such a good point. So we've had over 2,000 physicians from 10 different countries and all over the U.S. who have trained in the protocol, and we just actually had recently Recode 2.0 training. But what you said, I think, is is so important. As once you get a, a an accurate model of what the disease is, instead of just saying, "Okay, we're just going to go after the amyloid, or the tau, or the you know what have you," and the next thing, there have been so many different theories. We're going to just going to go after the herpes. We're just going to go after the P. gingivalis. We're just going to go after the you know what have you. Go in there, fill in the blank. As you now have a model that actually is predictive, what happens is people start seeing, "Ah, when I." change this or change that. I now got incremental improvements, and we're seeing this all the time. Um, do we need to address plasmalogens? As you know, Dr. Dan Goodnow is a biochemist who's done such interesting work with plasmalogens, and he's arguing that, yeah, that's an important piece as well. Um, other things that come up, do we now, what sorts of specific stimulation? It's turning out that things like violite or things like uh, you know specific 40 hertz stimulation, Lasers, for example, Dr. Robert Hedea has done beautiful work on including specific laser stimulation and has gotten excellent 
outcomes with his patients. So as we now see, okay, we're beginning to understand what Alzheimer's actually is. Now we can begin to make better and better. So we can do better and better with, you know, with the idea. It's just like, you know, once you start realizing we're not going to fly a prop plane to the moon, we're going to have to have a rocket. Okay, now we're going to get more and more sophisticated rockets. We're going to get better and better at, at targeting them until, of course, we just hear recently that <laughs> we've got uh, people going up in space uh, without the government here. So we get better and better at, at being able to do this. And now we've got you know, you got probes going to distant, uh, distant parts of the, of the solar system. So that's the same thing that's happening here. As just as you said, practitioners are finding, hey, this, here's an area that actually works better if we add this. I think the rocket analogy is a great analogy because, again, so many people poo-pooed the X prize of, yeah. you know, getting to space, private flight to space, the stuff that Richard Branson, you know, has been up to, Elon Musk and so many others. Yeah. And we're seeing that the, you know, that that what costs NASA, you know, so many X times more yeah. that the private industry is able to do at such a lower cost level. And it's actually we need a little bit of both yeah. because so many yeah. of the innovations that have happened in the private industry, just as is happening right now in Alzheimer's and the innovations that you guys are bringing to the table came from grants building on top of the soldiers, but shoulders of what the government would able, was able to get started, but we can't just stop there. We can't wait till we have this perfect intervention because the truth is there's somebody that's listening out there right now that who knows, maybe one day there'll be a drug that makes a significant more difference than what is the low bar that's been set now, but it's not gonna do it if it doesn't get to the root issues of it, but let's right. say it's a little bit better. What are you gonna wait another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to get maybe a significant improvement that's even just a little bit better than what we have now. We can't wait. We have that's to start with something. That's why we're spreading the word about what mm -hmm. you're up to. So I've got a question for you. Oh, sorry, yeah. we're going to jump I was, in. I was just going to say one thing because you mentioned the XPRIZE. I think it's, it's such a good example. One of my favorite stories was from the engineer who designed the XPRIZE winner, what, what eventually won the XPRIZE for, for space travel. And what he said was that they realized that there was no rocket available. There was nothing in the current approach that would allow them to do what was needed for the XPRIZE. You had to go up, a, you had to go twice within one week. You had to go up to, originally it was 100 miles and they realized no one could do that. They changed it to surreptitiously kind of to, to 100 kilometers. You had to go up, you had to come down, uh, et cetera. So he realized that anything that they suggested that was an inside the box, this is what's already available, this is how we do it, he knew would fail. So he knew that whatever it was that was going to win the X Prize was going to sound crazy when the first person suggested it. And it turned out that what they needed was a rocket that had two different shapes, one going up and one coming down. Mm. And so when he first suggested that, they were like, what are you talking about, two different shapes? So you actually had to change the shape of this while you were flying it. And so I think this is the same thing we're dealing with now. We're changing the idea of, okay, it's just gonna be a single drug, just tell us which drug it's gonna be, to no, let's go after the system. This is a deficiency of a subsystem. The drugs are gonna be critical for targeting specific things, but let's get larger data sets, Let, let's look at root cause analyses, and then let's address all of these things for best outcomes. Now we have a very different view of the disease, and now we can begin to make incremental improvements. It's a fundamental shift in how you look at things. Right. It's a fundamental shift. Let me ask you on a personal level, as you were putting these stories together and writing this book, what were you know, some of the themes or ideas that surprised you? Was there anything that surprised you as you were starting to put this together and present these stories for the larger population to read? Yeah, um, I was surprised initially by so how young some of the symptoms started. And of course, and I realize that again, this really brings back the, a fundamental scientific point. When you're dealing with something like a disease, there has to be internal consistency. In other words, 
when you see something on the clinical side, it has to fit what you see on the research side. It has to fit what you see on the epidemiological side. It has to fit what you see on the genetic side. These are all interlocking pieces. And where there's been so much failure in Alzheimer's is that scientists wanted to run with one idea. Oh, I see all I see amyloid under the microscope. Let's get rid of the amyloid. Well, wait a minute, that, that doesn't fit what you see with the clinical data now. Or they'll say, oh, it's reactive oxygen species. Let's go at, let's use an antioxidant to get rid of those reactive oxygen species. Well, that, that doesn't work for Alzheimer's disease. So you have to bring these things together. And so I realized, okay, what we're seeing as these remarkably early symptoms, Deborah described changes in her early 40s, even though she probably wouldn't have been in a nursing home until her late 50s or even early 60s, she was clearly identifying things where that were very sim similar to what happened to her father. Now, she could see what happened to her father as he progressed into his 60s and really got severe Alzheimer's disease. She then looked backward and said, aha, I remember the things he was saying and complaining about when he was practicing neurology way back in his 40s. She realized, oh, these things that I saw as you know minor changes, and oh yeah, you're just getting a little older, really were the harbingers of severe Alzheimer's. And so to hear these relatively young people talking about these changes and kind of the doctors just dismissing them, ah, yeah, you're in your 40s, you're no longer in your 20s or 30s, they're really telling you this was pre, pre, pre Alzheimer's. You know, this was the beginning of these pathophysiological underpinnings. So that surprised me initially. But again, seeing the, the biochemistry, it all started to come together and started to make sense. The other thing that surprised me was how much it made a difference to kind of stick with the critical pieces and how sticking with these and then continuing to optimize turned out to be so helpful. Some people will give up. They'll say, look, I've been, I've done this for a couple of weeks. Um, I don't see any major changes. You know, I'm going to move on to the next fad. You know, and, and so many of these fads, unfortunately, are not scientifically related. It's just, you know, take this pill, take this, you know, you hear it all the time, take this supplement and everything's going to be great. Um, it's the brain is not that simple. You really need to, to look more carefully at what's causing the problem. Sure, supplements are an important part. Again, it's interesting. The opposite side is from the academicians who say supplements can't be helpful. You know, well, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. You know, we these things do help change your neurochemistry. So we are looking at understanding the underlying neurochemistry and then going after that going after those pieces. And absolutely critical things can be helpful. You know, you can't tell me that omega-3s don't change your neurochemistry. That's been shown again and again and again. You can't tell me that resolvins don't have impacts on your neurochemistry. You can't tell me that things like whole coffee fruit extract that increases your BDNF, are, these things are not having impacts on your neurochemistry. And you can go down the list, list you know, um, your N-acetylcysteine, your Alcar, uh, your you know, rhodiola, your bacopa understanding how to use these and to target the right things in the right people. These are very powerful and you just have to know how to use them. So these, these sorts of things were all kind of eye-opening to me. But the most important thing to me by far was the happiness, the, 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 the families. For example, with Deborah, she knew watching her grandmother and her father and then seeing what's happening with herself and knowing her own genetics, she turned around and looked at her children, of course oh my gosh, what's their future? And so now to be able to say, for all future generations, they never have to deal with this again. That really makes me happy. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. We can scan brains 20 years ahead of time and determine already when there is compromised brain energetics. The choices we make in our 30s, 40s, and 50s are very relevant